it was a great time learning about a whole bunch of countries. I was a kind of a farm boy up to that point, so I learned a lot of stuff. And uh, then we were met in lay by a missionary from the Southern Highlands in New Guinea by the name of Lytle, Brother Lytle. And we took a plane from there to Mount Hagen where we got groceries and supplies, flew a little plane, single engine Cessna, down to a town called Kagwa. And then from there we took a Jeep for quite a ways out into the jungle. And then we finally had to walk. And there was no road back into where we were. We got there and we had a grass hut to live in. We got water out of the river. We were met by hundreds and hundreds of people that were so happy to meet us. They were so glad we came. Little did I know that in three months, I would have 40 of those little kids in school as a teacher. Okay, because when I finished high school, the missionaries there pushed me into going to the government and asking for a permit to teach. You could get a permit to teach when you finished high school. So I started teaching first grade to 40 kids. It had to be in English, so we couldn't communicate except in English, which was, which was really good for them. And uh, so our, typically, I was going to show you a little bit, when the first students first came, um, I don't suppose you can, you probably can see real well, but like the boys would wear what was called a lap lap that would go around their waist, or actually the boys wore what was called a puru puru, which was in the front, and then they would wear tanket leaves in the back. The girls would wear uh, a lap lap generally around them, and about the second year we were able to provide them uniforms. So then the, the girls had a blouse, the boys had a shirt, the, the boys had shorts, and the girls had a skirt. So eventually we had, we started out with 40 students. We ended up with 850 in that school. So it became a really big thing. I only taught for two years and then we had government teachers that were certified then and they came in and taught on the mission station. I was still responsible for all the building of the houses and the classrooms. And so I, I was really busy doing all that. I ran a sawmill built roads. We've, after about a year, we got a road into where our mission station was. So <clears throat> I was going to mention some of the classes that we had were math. Well, let me back up a little bit. So here we had thousands of people, right? And hundreds and hundreds of kids wanting to go to school, but we can take 40 and do a class. So can you imagine how we got to select them? To so first of all, I didn't, you know, we didn't know how old they were. So what the government taught us was if you could reach over your head and touch your ear, you're five years old. And surprisingly, that works basically anywhere. If you can reach over your head and touch your ear, you're five years old. You can try that yourself and see if you're five yet. <laughs> so that was the first criteria. They had to be five or a little older. And second of all, we did an IQ test. Well, they couldn't speak our language, we couldn't speak theirs, but the government provided us with an IQ test, which is basically uh, repetition and memory. So we would start out by maybe tapping a pencil on a desk like once, and the kid would tap back once, and then we'd do it three times. And then we'd do a series of different things, uh, you know, maybe three and two and five and seven, and they would repeat all that. And then we'd have a different kind of blocks lined up, and uh, with different uh, pictures on them. And we would show them one, they'd grab one and put it back. So all those were graded and you would think it wouldn't be very accurate, but I'm telling you what, those kids that were in those first classes were really smart. And what's interesting is here's 40 kids that have never sat anywhere. They haven't sat in school, they haven't sat in Sunday school, they've never been to church. So they're used to just running wild around the village, right? Doing whatever they wanted to do. So getting 40 kids corralled and sit down for a class, you would think would be very difficult, but this is the difference. They really wanted to be in school. Their parents really wanted to be in school. I had a problem because the, the kids' parents would come and hang in the windows and they'd get after their kids, especially when they were taking these IQ tests. I finally had to hang things over the window because the parents would be giving them advice to the window, do this, do that. Because they looked at going to school as a key to getting a job. And if they could get a job, then the parents would have some money. So they really wanted their kids to learn. And most of the kids ended up taking English names. I remember my best friend in high school was named Howard Russell. And so I had one kid in school that was such a cut up. 
His name was uh, Awe, but I ended up calling him Howard because he reminded me so much of my good friend Howard. Howard, this boy Howard was very smart. Awe was very, very smart. But he ended up just going back to the village uh, and living in the village, never went on to high school. But I have, my class consisted of kids who eventually became the state senator, or the government senator, uh, ambassador, a doctor, several nurses, uh, truck drivers, teachers, high school principals, uh, pastors, pastors' wives. It was amazing the, kin the things that these kids got to do, partly because they were the first kids in the whole area that got to go to school. So when they went on to high school and then on to college, they, they had the advantage of nobody else having competition with them. So, and they were smart. And they had an English speaking teacher to teach them English, where most of the other students had uh, native Papua New Guineans that were teaching them English. Obviously, by the time English gets passed down two or three times, it's not really as, as accurate as it is the first time. So it, it was pretty interesting being able to do that. And I later went on and taught some in, in uh, Pidgin English, um, which is a dialect that is composed of Chinese, English, some German, Motu from Papua New Guinea. It's a mixture of languages. It's its own language. In fact, I'll teach you a little song here, which is a real basic one in, in Pidgin. Um, so, so maybe we, we can, by the time I wrap up, we'll do that. And I'm, I'm trying to keep, I, I has got a lot of material here from Japan, so I really want to give her some time. But uh, when I first got there, obviously we, we had just grass schools uh, with grass roofs. And eventually we were able to build permanent buildings. And in the classroom, I built desks that were, uh, I took a sheet of plywood, divided it in three pieces. So it'd be 16 inches by eight feet. That was the desktop. And we built a rough frame to sit on. The desktop I painted with blackboard paint. And we had like three blackboards in each classroom. And so if the kids ran out of paper, which we supplied, they could take chalk and write on their desks for doing math class and learning English. We had English class, math class, writing class, reading class, science, and of course, phys ed, which they loved, which I guess I did as a boy too. <laughs> that was the only class I liked in school. <laughs> but uh, it, was, it was quite an experience as a young person uh, growing up. And I ended up spending, over a period of 17 years, I spent 12 years in Papua New Guinea. So I've got a lot of history there, I've got a lot of friends, and in fact, sometimes I still have friends that call me, pastors that call me from New Guinea, and I uh, has to put up with listening else to speak in another language, and uh, but love those guys. So, kind of as a wrap up, let me see. Do you have any questions for me before I teach you this little song? No. Do you think you learned anything? Do you, anybody know where Papua New Guinea is? No. Do you know where Australia is? What about Australia? New Guinea is just north of Australia. It's near the equator. So it's a tropical rainforest, mostly. It's the second largest island in the world. Uh, the, the entire island is 1,500 miles long, 500 miles wide, as opposed to the island that Iowa was born on, which is very small. The population when I went to New Guinea was just around 3 million people. For a huge land mass, that's pretty small. It's at least twice that large now, as far as the population is concerned. And they're, they've experienced a lot of problems. They have a lot of natural resources, a lot of gold and oil and silver and copper. The largest copper mine in the world is in New Guinea. One of the largest gold mines in the world is in New Guinea. A lot of oil is coming out of New Guinea. And yet at the same time, the people are not any better off. I think there's a lot of government people that are stealing the money, a lot of companies that are taking advantage of New Guinea, but the roads and the schools and the medical field is not any better as far as it's worse in the jungles than it was when I was there. But the school, school still goes on. The, one of the girls that I taught in those two years went on to become an RN. She's back providing medical care for her people in that area. 
the man that became a doctor from my two classes is now, he's in one of the cities and he's a medical doctor in the city, not back in the village. But uh, anyhow, that's just in a, in a nutshell, it's, it's what, uh, it's where New Guinea is. So these kids love to sing. And that's one thing we do is have devotions to start the day with. We gather around the flagpole, which initially was an Australian flag. And then when they became independent in 1974, it became the Papua New Guinea flag. And so they'd gather around the flagpole, hundreds of kids, and we would sing a few songs and they'd all pledge allegiance to their flag. And the allegiance would always end up with, <clears throat> I, will, I will honor my God, I will serve my country, and uh, hang on a second, it was, I'll serve my country, honor my God, and serve my queen, because they're under Queen Elizabeth. So anyhow, that's, that was kind of an interesting thing we did every morning. The song is, this is the day, do you know that song, this is the day that the Lord has made? Yeah. So this is in Pigeon, and I picked this one because the words are very similar, if not almost real close to English, where some, some songs are so different that you wouldn't recognize anything. But it goes, this, this is the day, is dispel a day, dispel a day, God he been working it, that God made, this is the day God made. And then we will rejoice, is Yumi Amamas, <clears throat> lift him up in name, or, or praise the Lord, we'll praise it, lift him up in name. And then this for the day, God he been working, Yumi Amamas, lift him up in name. This for the day, this for the day, God he been working. So it goes like this. This fella day, this fella day, God he been working, God he been working, you me I'm a mas, you me I'm a mas, lift him up in name, lift him up in name. This fella day, God he been working, you me I'm a mas, lift him up in name. This fella day, this fella day, God he been working. The kids would sing this in rounds. So you'd get, you know, half the class doing it at one time and then they'd pick up the next line. Really interesting and they just love to do that. These kids sometimes walked for an hour and a half, up to two hours to get to school. And they'd started, the school started at eight o'clock in the morning, so they'd have to start, you know, at 6.30 in the morning, it was cold, rainy. We lived about a mile high. And when school got out, almost every single day it was raining when school got out. They had to walk all the way back in the rain. Their only umbrella would be a banana leaf or maybe a toddle leaf, which is a little bit more covering than a banana leaf. But these kids got cold. They almost always had colds when they came to school. So their nose would be running. Of course, they had no Kleenex. And so some kids that had both nostrils running all the time, kids would nickname them number 11 <laughs> because they had two streaks on their lip. And even when they cleaned it off, that would be a little lighter colored than the rest. So they'd be called number 11 or sometimes number seven if one nostril came down like this. <laughs> Not a great thing for your classroom today, I know. <laughs> but anyhow, Aya's gonna come and uh, she's got, I, I spent about 17 minutes, I think. So Aya's gonna come and uh, share with you about Japan. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi everyone, I'm so excited to share with you guys today. I want to thank Miss Trisha for thinking of us. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about my island before we get started or into the rest of the stuff that you can't really see, but I'll show you in a minute. So my island is really tiny and if you've ever been to Hawaii or heard about Hawaii, the weather is kind of like that. It's right on the equator. So I can walk a mile pretty easily in 15 minutes. Sometimes I can do that in you know, a bit less than that. So my island is three miles wide at, at its widest point. It's like 81 miles long. So if there were no buildings or anything in the way, I could probably walk across the whole island in less than an hour. So it's a pretty small island. So everywhere you look is ocean. Anytime you wanna see the ocean, you can see the ocean. And then I end up in the middle of America, far from any ocean, right? So anyway, that's just a little bit about my island. and. Let's see, you guys are probably about, what, 12, 13? 14, 
9, 10, and 11. Ooh, you guys look grown up. 9, 10, and 11, yeah. Okay, so so I, I'm going to grab this phone and carry it because I had a little display for you guys. And being on FaceTime, you can't really see it. But I'm going to show you. I set up a kimono here, which I'm sure you guys have seen before. And then I have what's called a shishi dog. And I have the shoes that go with the kimono. And I have a tea set or ocha set. And then this is a doll that's dressed up in their wedding garment or wedding kimono. And then this is a little Buddha, which I'll talk about their religion. Um, a lunchbox. And another little lunchbox. And then we have a rice bowl with some chopsticks. Let's see, where's the soup bowl? Can you see the soup bowl yet? Hang on. Rice bowl, there's the soup bowl. Okay, and then I have the other lion over here. So those are just some things that I'm gonna show you as we go. Um, let me set you back up. Okay, is that good? All right, so first I wanna talk about Christmas because I know you guys are kind of talking about Christmas around the world. So Japan has become very westernized in that they do celebrate Christmas, but it's a lot about Santa and the Christmas tree and presents. And they don't really know the true meaning of Christmas like we do here unless some missionaries come to tell them. But um, their big celebration is New Year's. And um, all the children get little envelopes with money in it. And typically it's a pretty good sum of money. And you'll get that from family members, you'll get that from good friends. And the money that you get is the people that give you the money they're asking the new year's gods to bless and protect that child that they give money to so as a child of the missionary they really wanted to make our god happy too so i typically got a lot of money at new year's this was called oshogatsu and the little money envelopes was called otoshidama and you could get a you, i could make a lot of money just collecting money at um new year's time their religions are Buddhism and Shintoism, and that's what this little guy is. This is Buddha, and this is who they, one of the gods they pray to, that the, this is their religion, Buddhist religion. I don't have a Shinto god with me, but that's Mr. Buddha, and um, let's see. So, and that uh, New Year celebration is also a Buddhist celebration. Um, in August each year, they have another celebration that they call Obon, and they have all these special dances, and it, it lasts for three days, and they set up these huge stages all over the community, and everyone dances these special dances to call back their dead ancestors. And so the dead ancestors will come to visit during this time, and a lot of people will visit the tombs, and they'll take food, and also in the houses, they have little altars, and um, there's certain times that they celebrate a one-year anniversary of a death, a three-year anniversary. Surprisingly, we know that Jesus died when he was 33 years old. They also do a special celebration at 33 years of death. But you have to set food up there. You have to make sure to give food to your ancestors and different gifts to keep them happy so that you'll continue to be blessed. So Obon is a very, very big celebration time. And this is also a Buddhist event. And so... Um, then I want to talk about the kimono because when they do these dances, they wear the kimono that I showed you. Um, a kimono is just a gown. A yukata is a summer gown. But the men and the women all wear these. So the men look like they have on dresses too, but they're typically dark colors like black or blue or green. They don't have flowers on them. The ladies, of course, are very colorful and flowered. And so anyway, they all wear these and they dance and and um, then I want to talk about, you know, this is not what they wear all the time. These are for great celebrations and weddings. But the um, Japanese school kids all wear the exact same uniform to school. They have to have the exact same haircut. So basically from a distance, every girl looks exactly the same. Every boy looks exactly the same. And the only way that you're allowed to have long hair is if you're a dancer. And, and the dances are these special folklore dances that are stories. They may be stories about going fishing or a wedding or you know whatever, but they all tell stories. They're not like dancing, what we consider here is dancing. So the dancing girls, the ones that take these special lessons to learn all the Japanese folklore dancing, they're allowed to have the long hair and they have to have long hair because that's part of their, um, their 
uh, uniform or their celebratory costumes. So then um, they take their lunches to school and tip, and even um, if you go to a, what we would call a potluck, they have big ones of these and they pack their lunches in here and their tight clothes. Their lunches are typically rice with maybe some pickles and some seaweed around it, but you can see they're in little sections. They can put their pickles in here and then maybe their meat in the bottom, but they eat very, very healthily like fish and rice and not not very much meat not very much red meat at all so day every single day they eat rice and and miso soup every single day rice is typically with every meal and um, one of the things that the kids love to eat when they get home is bread they'll just grab a piece of bread and they'll eat that for a snack but it's really thick bread and it's sweet it looks like our white bread maybe sort of like Texas toast but it's sweet. It's almost not like a donut. Their sweets aren't too super sweet. But then I showed you the little tea set over there. They drink uh, green tea every day. And one of the things that they talk about the Japanese being very famous for is how long they live, their longevity. And part of that is, uh, um, they say is because of the green tea that they drink. It ha it's full of antioxidants. And um, so while many people live to be very old in Japan, Okinawa, the island where I'm from, they're really known to live. In fact, I think the oldest person alive right now lives in Okinawa. They have the most um, octogenarians, the most centurions, the oldest people, centenarians in the world, uh, percentage-wise of their population. Now, when they go to school over there, they go very, very early. They may be up at five o'clock in the morning, <clears throat> getting ready to go to school. They do not a lot of times eat breakfast at home, they don't eat lunch at home, and they don't eat supper at home. Because once they finish school, any subject that they're having difficulty with, they go to what's called juku. So it's like special tutoring. So if they need help with math, they'll go to math tutoring. If they need help with English, because they learn English, they'll go to English tutoring. But their main goal in life is to pass their college entrance exam. If they do not pass this exam to get into college, they're considered a fail, failure forever, and many of them commit suicide if they don't pass this exam to get into college. So this is a reason they go to school from before the sun comes up until the sun goes down. And then, of course, not like here in the U.S., but music is just as important as math, English, science, history. They have to have music classes, and then they have to have sports. They're all on sports teams. And their biggest sports day of the entire week is Sunday. So all of their competitions is on Sunday. They have uniforms for that too. They all look alike, exact same uniforms. And so um, basically they go to school from every single day from morning till night. And they, a lot of them don't even learn to do chores once they become, once they graduate from high school and they think about getting married, then they start learning about cleaning house. And wouldn't that be nice? You don't have to clean house or wash dishes till you're like 20. I had a friend come over to help me and she wanted to help me wash dishes one time and she put all cold water. In. I thought, what is she doing? All cold water. She got the rag with no soap. So I had to teach my friend who was like 18 how to wash dishes. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, um, yeah, um, they learn. One thing about Japan is they learn personal responsibility you know, you don't blame everybody else for the things that you do. They're very much into teamwork. Everything's a team. When you go to work, you everyone, they wear a uniform at work. Sometimes they get to vote and, and choose the uniforms, but they all look the same at work. They're all very helpful. They're not trying to get ahead of each other. They're very polite and very kind people, very quiet. You know, um, if if there's a nat natural disaster, nobody's looting or burning things down or trying to steal from businesses that have been left. Um, they're just very much responsible for their own actions. They work very, very hard. In Okinawa, they all have gardens. Um, one of the things they do every night is they clean their porches. You'll see all the little old ladies out washing their porches off and sweeping them. Very, very clean people. Um, then, of course, you guys have probably all tried to use chopsticks. Has everyone tried to use chopsticks? No, yes, are you good at it? No. No? Yeah, so um, you need to grab you a pair of chopsticks and learn how to use them. A lot of people can even cut their meat with them. 
I don't do that. I just, I just like bite it, you know? Anyway, um, in, in America, it's very rude to like, this is the soup bowl. It's very rude to drink out of your bowl. But in Japan, you pick your bowl up like this and you eat the, well, how do you, how do you drink it? You know, if you don't have a spoon. So you eat all the innards out and then you tip your bowl up and drink it. You'll take your bowl of rice and then you grab like your meat or your veggies and you kind of stick it on top of there and you put it under your mouth and you just kind of eat it like this. And they eat really fast too. So you guys need to practice with some chopsticks because if you ever go to Japan, you may just have to eat with your fingers if you can't use chopsticks. All right, so then I wanna talk about the um, Shisa dogs. This is the Shisa dog. So I think I... One second. I'm getting you on Bluetooth so I can hear, so they can hear you better. There you go. Okay, so then I'm going to talk to you about the Shisa dogs. Um, these are actually a cross between a lion and a dog. And on every house and on every temple and on every business in Okinawa, you will find these on each corner. This is the girl one because she has her mouth open. I don't know why they made the girl one with the mouth open. But anyway, that's the girl one. And she's on the left side of the house. And then I'll show you the boy one. He has his mouth closed. And he's usually, uh, a lot of times, he's the only one with this sphere. The girl one sometimes will have a cub. And the guy one is always on the right. And so the story about these is that um, in Okinawa, there was this huge dragon that would come out of the ocean and it would eat children and it would just terrorize a community anytime that it came up out of the ocean. And so this young priestess had gone to China and had been given a lion dog on a pendant that she wore around her neck. And when this dragon came out, you know, they were just desperate to know what to do about this dragon. And so she told the, the king of Okinawa, she said, if you would take this maybe if you would take this lion and you would hold it up to the dragon when it came out, I think that might would help. And so the next time the dragon came out, they grabbed that lion and they held it up and a big boulder fell from the sky and pinned the dragon's tail to the ocean floor and they never saw that dragon again, didn't kill their children and eat them anymore. And so these um, are to ward off, these are to ward off the evil spirits and to welcome the good spirits. So these are called shishi dogs and they're very, um, they, you know, Okinawa is now part of Japan and it's one of the many, many Ryukyu Islands, it's, but it's the largest one. But these are um, an Okinawan tradition. They have them in China and, J and mainland Japan, but these are from Okinawa. So I really like these guys. So um, I don't know if you guys have any other questions. I grew up over there, so I speak Japanese fluently and I wasn't born an American citizen, so I got naturalized. Some of you have probably been hearing a lot about that lately. So I'm a naturalized citizen, and uh, it's such a blessing to be a citizen of the greatest country in the world, America. Um, do you guys have any questions about anything that I talked about? Yes? Um, when you lived in Japan, how far away did you live um, from Jacob? From where? America? From Osa? Uh, I think it's O S A A. Oh, Osaka? Mm -hmm. From Osaka. So um, it was about a three hour um, plane ride to uh, Tokyo. So you would fly like into Tokyo and then get a bullet train. Uh, it's called the Shinkansen. Uh, travels really quickly, really fast, with the fastest train in the world, and then you could go to Osaka or wherever, but about a three-hour plane ride from my island to mainland Japan. Have you been to Osaka? No. Yeah. We know somebody there. Oh, that's nice. Anybody else? Um, how did you meet the guy that's in your house? How did I meet the guy that's in my house? Is that what she asked me, my husband? So um, being missionaries, a lot of times you hear about other missionaries. So they were missionaries in New Guinea, but I didn't talk about my parents being missionaries in Okinawa. Um, my parents were missionaries in Okinawa 
And um, actually they were babysitting me when my mom died. And my mom died when I was 15 months old. So the missionaries that were from here, from Oklahoma, adopted me. So I had heard of the Kellys who were missionaries in New Guinea, and we actually struck up a conversation on Facebook, if you can believe that. That's cool. Anybody else? Data wanted to know earlier if you, um, if you, if you worshiped those gods or if they were just part of the of Japan. Yes, yeah, so they do pray to, to Buddha and, and the Shinto gods. But the funny thing about, or maybe it's not funny, the interesting thing is that they have many, many gods. They have a kitchen god and a yard god and a sea god and a car god and every kind of god that you can think of. And if they have a lot of problems or say they have a baby that's sick, then they feel that they have upset one of the gods or they haven't made one of the gods happy enough. And sometimes you'll find a mom carrying her baby and just walking all over the island trying to find which God that she needs to appease so that her baby can get better. And so when we teach them about God, um, that's easy for them to accept God or Jesus because that's just another God that they need to, to um, please or to appease. It's very hard for them to have one God. So it's not difficult to tell them about another God. It's difficult to tell them that there's only one true God because they, you know, they, they have little things they hang in their car and pray to, little gods they set in their yard. They have little, everywhere you go, you can find little gods. So. So I'm here and I don't see God. No, we don't have little gods here in Washington. No, I think in America, sometimes we, we get something we really love, like um, like maybe a really fancy car or you know something that's really important to us, and sometimes we can make things like that more important to us. But we have to be careful about that. Yeah. Any more questions? I'm going to teach you two words in Japanese when when you don't have any more questions. Do you do any of the Christmas traditions? Do I do do I carry on traditions? Um. I'll have to think about that for just a second. Um, you hand things over the door. Huh? You put things in the door. Right? Yeah, I, I find myself uh, doing a lot of things um, really without thinking about it. Um, in Japan, we don't shake hands ever. Um, of course, they are becoming a little, hi. They're coming a little more westernized, so you know they might, if they see an American, they might want to shake their hands. But they always bow. And if you're being very respectful, like to say the oldest grandpa in the community, you'll bow really deep, or, or a king, you'll bow really deep. If you see a neighbor lady, you might just you know bow your head a little bit. So I always find myself, if I tell someone thank you, or it's good to see you, I always bow my head like this, always. If you ever meet me and I'll say, hi, how are you? I will bow just like that. It's just one of those things. But um, a lot of times they have beads you you guys have seen the beads that you hang over your door like the pretty little pink beads um over there uh it's a it's a custom they have those or like long pieces of material that they hang over their doors and they kind of feel like when you walk under them it'll brush the evil spirits off as you enter a room or enter a house and so i i have beads decorative beads over some of my doors um but I guess one of the things is growing up in Japan, uh, traditions are very important. And so I find myself carrying on my American traditions. Like I, I have all of these things that I always do, um, big traditions for me. But one thing we do is on Christmas day, we have Japanese food. That's one of the traditions that, that we do. Uh, my daughter loves Japanese food. And so we- You can sing like we the dances. Too. Japanese food. Oh, <laughs> so when they sing, yeah? Uh, I just forget my question. Did you forget it? Well, if you think of it, let me know. Um, a lot of the little Japanese old grandmas sing the traditional Japanese folk tunes. And I will sing a little bit of one. Exactly how they sound. You can go Google it later. This is how they, this is exactly how they sound.
and they sing up in these high-pitched voices and do their dances, but that, that's really how they sing their dance tunes. Now, when they sing other songs, they don't sing like that. I would love for you to come to my house. It's, it's kind of far though. It would be a long, it would be a long road trip. Okay. Huh? Oh, 12 hours. Whew. You, you would find out how well you get along with each other traveling 12 hours in a car. <laughs> okay, I'm going to teach you two words that will be easy to remember, okay? The first one is Ohio. Can you say Ohio? Ohio. Ohio. That's good morning. So when you see each other Thursday morning or the, the today is Thursday morning, the next morning you get together, you can say Ohio to each other. Okay, how many of you like tacos? One, two. All of you like tacos? Yeah? I don't like tacos. Do you, do you like do you like octopus? Ooh, yeah. You, you don't? You don't like to chew on those little suction cups? It's chewy. It's it's chewier than beef jerky. Okay, taco means octopus in Japanese. So next, you, you can ask your brothers, if you have brothers, if they like tacos and then give them some octopus. If they say, yeah, give them some octopus. So Ohio's good morning, taco is octopus, and then... Huh? Ohio? Not tomorrow. Have a good Ohio. Yes. Um, so my, I took my daughter when she was 17 to Okinawa, and she put all of our videos of every day we were there, she journaled live on YouTube. So if any of you guys are interested in seeing those where she's eating octopus and raw fish and pig's ears, if you're interested, um, there's like nine days of videos on YouTube that I can send the link to Miss Trisha. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. You guys have a good day. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. <laughs>